Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, as we continue our series on the church this morning. We are not working through Acts. We will eventually move away from Acts. Um, we are actually, if, our, if we were to go back to where we were, it's our series in Matthew, but that's to come. We will go back there. I've not forgotten about the gospel of Matthew, but our church has been changing, and our church has been growing, and, and um, we've been getting so many new people. And I think it's important to, at times, just kind of hit the button that just kind of says, you know, I mean, this is who we are as a church. This is what a church is, biblically. And so that's what we're trying to do, is to communicate and teach what the church is according to God's word. I think so much of my life, the church was just what I had experienced. It's just what I have been, have gone to my whole life. And I really didn't take a lot of time until the last 10, 15 years of my life to begin to dive into God's word and say, what is the church, God? What do you want in a church? And, and especially then as the responsibility and the accountability came to me four and a half years ago to be a shepherd of a church, I really felt like now I better know. I better learn because now I'm accountable to Jesus Christ for Norton Baptist Church and how I lead us. And so that's why we're doing this series and so let's look at Acts chapter 2 and see what God would teach us this morning by his Holy Spirit through his word. Acts 2, 42 through 47. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and were dividing them up with all, as anyone might have need. And daily devoting themselves with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Father, I just ask that you would help us by your spirit once again. You have been so faithful to work in our hearts and lives to change us. Do it again today. Send forth your spirit on the preaching and in our hearts and work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, this is our, our third sermon in the church series, really, but we have yet to even spend much time defining the word church. And perhaps maybe we should have began there, but I think this is a great place to begin to define what is a church. What do we mean when we use the term church? And many people would think that means the building, it's the property, it's where the people do meet and it's that location or the building, and we would say that. I've used it many times like that. You know, I'll tell my wife, I'm, I'm going to go down to the church, you know, and I, I mean the building. You may or may not be here, but that's what I mean when I say that. So we use that term that way. Uh, some people use that term to talk about what they do in their pajamas on Sunday morning at their home on their couch, watching the sermon online or the service online, and and they call that church. It's not church, but they call it church. Uh, some people uh, in, in, our, in our world refer to it as an organization. My mom grew up a Catholic, and the Catholic church would call herself the church. That's what she calls herself. That's what they would call themselves. And my mom grew up in, in, that way, and she would say that she was taught that her faith must be in the church. Not, not as much in Christ, but in the church. That's what she was taught. We, however, when we use the term church, we want to be biblical. Like every other terminology that we use, we want to draw out from the Word of God. What does the all-sufficient Word of God say about the church? What is the church? How does it define the church? And the word translated church is the word ekklesia in Greek, ekklesia. It means, really, it was used to be a political body of a city or a town. You could almost think of a city council. That was the 
ecclesia in those days. A president of the Norton City Council is a member of our church here. And uh, so you can think of Doug and then his group of merry men. No, I'm just kidding. They're not merry men. <laughs> but <laughs> Tammy just was shocked by that. Uh, merry men, are you sure? No, I mean, there's a, you can think of a city council, though, in that sense. That's what it was. That was its common usage. And so it would refer to these leaders in the community. They would always be members of the ecclesia, of the council. But the council really didn't exist in just one of them. The council had to come together. And then you had the ecclesia. Uh, Doug has no authority as the president of the council to just do things willy-nilly. He has to meet with the council, and he has to come together, and they need to assemble. And so these people in these towns, in these cities, would be called out to assemble to do the business of the town. Similar, again, to what we might have in a city council today. And so you were a member, if you were a member of this council, you would be a member of the ecclesia all the time, but the ecclesia really wasn't in existence until you were together. Does that make sense? And you can see maybe why that became a usage for the church, that we are members of the church wherever we are if we are in Christ, or we are a member of a local church, and we'll talk about that in a moment, we are members wherever we are, but there's really a sense in which the church is not just me, it's not just you out there somewhere. The church is the assembly. The church is when we get together, when we're called to come together, that's when the church is in existence at that point in time. In the Bible, we have two aspects really of the usage of the word ecclesia or church. The first aspect would be the invisible aspect of the church. There is what we might call the invisible church. You say, what's the invisible church? Some people might use the term the global church, the worldwide church. But that's not sufficient, really, because the invisible church isn't just on the earth. The invisible church is all saints in heaven and on the earth. It's invisible. And part of the invisibility is that some are in heaven. But the reality is, Scripture would actually teach us that we're all there. If you're in the invisible church, you are in heaven. You say, this is not heaven. Don't try to tell me that. <laughs> I understand. But Scripture says in Ephesians 2 that we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ. That's our reality. Colossians 3 says your life is now hidden with Christ in God, or in God, or with God in Christ. I'm sorry. Your life is now hidden with God in Christ. Your real life is not here anymore. And that's the invisible church. All who are Christians, all who have, who have come to Christ, they are in the invisible church, whether they are in heaven or whether they are on earth, they are in the invisible church. It's invisible from another aspect that you don't have a big C marked on your forehead that can tell me you're in the church. I can run into somebody at Walmart. I don't know that, I don't like to go to Walmart. I don't like why I use that example. But anyway, I, can, I cannot know whether they are a Christian or not, whether they're in the invisible church or not, just by seeing them. And in fact, the truth of the matter is, I can't look out here and know that you're in the invisible church just because you're here this morning. I don't know. I can't tell. All those in the invisible church have the mark of the Holy Spirit. But how do I know you're not faking fruit? How do I know whether you're really in Christ or not? The one who knows, who is in the invisible church, is God. God knows who are his. God knows in whom he has placed the seal of the Holy Spirit. He knows I trust many of you that I have great relationship with that you are there as well. I trust as I continue to give you the gospel that if you're not, that the Holy Spirit would have convicted you and brought you to that place. But we can't know, can we? It's invisible. It will all be sorted out in the end, will it not? The invisible church will become visible with Christ. But that's the other aspect. There is also not just the invisible church in Scripture, and by the way, that's about 20% of the references of Ecclesia in the church, only 20%. One in five refer to the invisible church. It's actually a little less than one in five. I 
tried to do the calculations, and somebody sent me an email this week that had different calculations than I did, and I think some of those you could go either way, but I'd say four out of five of the references of the ecclesia are the other type, which is the visible church. Visible church. You can see what's visible, correct? The visible church. And so what is the visible church? It is the expression of the church here on earth. She can be seen. She can be identifiable. It is being a, a member of a local church. You can see who is a member and who is not of the local church. That is visible. The visible church is born here in Acts chapter 2. The apostles, were they not in the invisible church prior to Peter preaching that sermon? The invisible church, as you could really argue, has always existed because it has always been, there have always been people of God. But the visible church comes into existence in Acts chapter 2 when these 3,000 souls are saved and we see what they were devoted to in verse 42. That's when the visible church comes into being here on earth. It is the expression of the invisible church here on earth. Let me say it this way. All who are in Christ are in the invisible church. But not all who are in Christ are in the visible church. There are those who are saved, and I believe truly redeemed, that have not identified with the visible expression of the church. For many reasons, some, some may have been hurt at a visible church, at a local church. And so they have said, I'm not going to go get hurt again. And so they've refrained from that. Some maybe have not been taught that you need to be a part of a local church. And they were redeemed by God, but without good teaching, without sound doctrine, they haven't learned, I need to be a part of a visible church, a local church. And so there might be other reasons as well. But since 80% of the references in the New Testament to the church reference the visible church, the local church, then those who claim to be in Christ but do not attach themselves to the visible church are disobedient to those texts. How can you obey what is given to the local church if you're not a part of the local church? You can't. If you, aren't, if you claim to be a Christian but you're not a part of the local church, that is incongruent. There's nothing in Scripture that allows for that. There's no concept in Scripture. I've heard people say, well, nothing in the Bible about church membership. Well, I can't find you a command that says you must be a member of a church. And you know why? Because the apostles assumed it. They, they were like, what? Why would you even ask the question? The Bible, the New Testament is written to the church, to the visible church. Philippians wasn't written to a guy named Philip. Okay? There might have been a Philip in the congregation. But it was written to the church in Philippi. And Ephesians, we're in the church in Ephesus. And we have got to stop being so individualistic with the Bible. This is written to the church. And by the way, by extension, it's written to Norton Baptist Church. It's written to you all. You all, I guess I'll say. You guys, if I was from New Jersey, right? <laughs> if I was from the South, y'all. You know, that's who it's written to. It's written to us. Not to me as an individual. That is the church. That's 80% of the references to the church. There is no concept in Scripture of a Christian who is detached from the body of Christ visibly from the local church. The Christian who refuses the local church is disobedient to Christ. They are refusing the visible expression of the bride of Christ, claiming to love Christ, but having nothing to do with his bride. It ought not to exist. And I understand you're here in church, you're here in the visible expression this morning, but somebody might be watching online. What are you doing? Get to church. You need to be a part of the visible church if you're going to be obedient to Christ. Also, not everyone in the visible church belongs in the invisible church. We can say it that way too. There are people who become members of the church who are not Christians. Now we do our best 
to interview, to ask questions, and to have someone share a testimony. We interviewed somebody last week. We'll be bringing in a new member shortly. And we do our best to ask and interview and, and hope to see that their hope is in Christ. But, but people can lie. People can be self-deceived. And so people can enter into the visible church by expression of church membership, but they are not in the invisible church. They are on their way to hell. Don't ever think, I'm a member of a local church. I'm going to heaven. That will do nothing for you at the judgment seat. You must be in Christ and in Christ alone if you think that you are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so do not rely on church membership. There are imposters and deceivers and false teachers that can creep into the visible church. It's all through scripture, these warnings. If it wasn't there, if we didn't have to be concerned about it, then there wouldn't be warnings about it. The wheat and the tares grow together, Jesus said. And by the way, wheat and tares look alike. I, I, I heard somebody who was teaching on that text, and they were saying the wheat and the tares grow together, so this person we know is unregenerate, and we know is unredeemed, and lives like a, 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 a I don't know what I want to say, but lives like a completely unregenerate person, lives a completely, a lifestyle that's openly uh, rebellious against God. We need to just let them grow up. No, the wheat and the tares look alike. When you have somebody like that, we need to directly go to them and say, what are you doing here? You need to repent and turn to Christ. I mean, don't come in here and parade your sin around in our church. No, you need to repent and turn to Christ. I might give them a couple of weeks, give them a few warnings about what they can and can't do while they're here, but if they continue parading their sin around here, I'm going to get right to the point. There's no point in you continuing to come if you are going to continue in your sinfulness and try to parade your sinfulness in front of this church. This person was a transgender cross-dresser type person. That cannot happen. That cannot continue. Why? Because I love that person far too much to let them continue to sit here and feel better about themselves instead of coming to Jesus and turning their life over to him. You say you're picking on LGBTQ people? Not at all. I love them. I'm willing to tell them the truth, that they need Jesus, that Jesus doesn't just accept everybody just as they are. He takes them in and changes them and transforms their lives, and that's what these people need. That's what I need. That's what you need. They're not exceptions. Somehow, we in the church today have made exceptions for certain people. No, you all need change. I love you, but you all need to change, right? Right? We all need it, including this preacher. I say that many times. So the visible church is not synonymous with the invisible church. We see that. Some are in the invisible, not the visible. Some are in the visible, but not the invisible. So what is this expression of the visible church? And I think we're seeing it clearly in Acts 2.42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread... And to the prayers, the fellowship. We talked about them being devoted to the apostles' teaching last week and sound doctrine. Now this week I want to talk about fellowship. And I will just be right up front on this. I believe the rest of that text is describing their fellowship. That they were devoted to the fellowship. What is fellowship? I remember hearing somebody say, you know, we, I think we had one too. We had a fellowship hall in our church that I grew up in, you know, so I guess fellowship was whatever happened in that room, you know, because that's where the fellowship happened, you know, but, you know, that's not what fellowship, we often, often use the term fellowship to talk about our gathering together for, well, we're going to have a meal, we'll have a fellowship meal, but I think we need a better understanding of fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia, um, you probably heard that word, that's a common word that people will use in English to talk about fellowship, the word is koinonia. And so what is the fellowship? Well, it is to have close mutual association, a shared participation in something together, being involved in communion with one another. That is what fellowship is. I would argue the word fellowship could really be interchangeable with the word church, that we are a fellowship. And then in the church, in the town I grew up in, there was a church there named Christian Life Fellowship. It could have been Christian Life Church, but they chose the word fellowship. And, and I think they were representing, we aren't just a 
a stodgy thing. We're a fellowship. And I believe fellowship and church could be interchangeable. They might bring out a few different aspects of one another. But we could call ourselves a fellowship. We could call ourselves a church. And either term would be acceptable. It's a synonymous term in some aspects. These 3,000 souls are saved. They come to Jesus. And now they have fellowship with one another. They are devoted to the fellowship. They have died to themselves. And they now live for the fellowship. They live for the one another. No longer for me. These, they may have been a lot of strangers within that 3,000. Remember, we're just in the city of Jerusalem on Pentecost. Peter preaches a sermon, 3,000 come, and I bet you a lot of more strangers to one another. But immediately after, they're all like, hey, you're my brother. You're, you know, they woke up that morning total strangers, and they, and they went to bed that night great friends because they were devoted to the fellowship from there on. This is a fellowship. It's a mutual. What was their mutual association based upon? And I think we can see it on two things, verses 38 and 39. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. What is the promise that they were given? They would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Each one received a spirit? No, the spirit. Because there's one spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. There is only one spirit. One God, one spirit, right? And so they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is their fellowship based on? Well, you have the spirit, I have the spirit. Guess what? We have fellowship. Or you could say it this way. I have fellowship with the spirit. And if I have fellowship with the spirit, and you have fellowship with the spirit, then we have fellowship with one another. It's a natural outgrowth of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit that you would have fellowship with everyone else who also receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening here. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, at the close of his book there, he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul encouraged them to live out that fellowship that they've been given because of their commonality of receiving the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2.1, Paul said, there, um, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, and then he goes on, but I just want to point out those ifs there are really if there is and there is. For example, if there's any encouragement in Christ, is there encouragement in Christ? Yes, there is. So he doesn't mean if there is, like maybe there is, maybe there isn't. No, he's saying if there is, and there is. If there is any consolation of love, is there consolation of love? Amen. Absolutely there is. There is. If there is any fellowship of the Spirit, is there fellowship of the Spirit? There is. That's what he's saying there. We have fellowship with the Spirit. And if we have fellowship with the Spirit, we have fellowship with one another. They identified with the Spirit. They had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Ephesians 4 says, one Lord, one baptism, one Spirit, one God, the Father of all. Eventually, he gets to there. Not only, though, was it based on the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It's based on their fellowship with Christ. They identified with Jesus as Christ and Lord. Look back with me there. Again at verse 38, repent in each of you, or I'm, I'm sorry, 36, 36. Therefore let the, all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then in verse 38, he tells him to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. To identify with Jesus in baptism, in a public profession, to identify with Jesus as what? As Lord and Christ. This would have been so new to these Jewish people in Jerusalem that now it's not just Yahweh, but there's a son that we must worship. And he's Lord and he's Christ. Now, it wouldn't have been new in that there was a Christ or a Messiah to come, but the idea to link it all together didn't occur to these people until the Spirit took the blinders off to let them see the truth of God's word as Peter preached it. And so we see they have fellowship 
with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 9, to the same church in Corinth, he talked about the fellowship of the Spirit. Paul wrote, God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 1 3, we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may also believe with us. And indeed, now listen to this our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Jesus Christ. Our fellowship is Trinitarian in that sense. It's with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the fellowship we have. Now let me tell you something. There is no greater, sweeter, perfect fellowship than the fellowship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No greater unity, no greater oneness than that. And it's the same oneness we are given in the church. It's the same oneness we are called to in the church. You should be having your mind blown right now. Like, are you kidding me that I'm supposed to treat you like the Holy Spirit treats Jesus? Yes. That oneness, that unity, that is the picture of the church that God paints for us in the scriptures, that we are to be so one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternally one. Never having been separated, never having been parted. And, and we're supposed to be like that. Jesus actually prayed that. John 17, if you would turn there with me, I think it would be worth the time to look at it. Jeff read this prayer, this high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 17. And I want to just focus on a few verses real quickly to point out the importance of this oneness. John 17, now look verse 11. And I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. Now here, Jesus is talking about, is, is speaking about, is praying for his apostles, his 12 minus Judas Iscariot, he knows who the devil is, so he's praying for his 11 at that point. And he's saying, make them one. And we see the apostles were gathered together at Pentecost, right, praying together, and the Spirit comes upon them all in oneness, and we see that. And not that they never had differences among the apostles, but we have the New Testament testimony of their consistent testimony of their oneness, of agreement among all the books of the New Testament that they were written by the apostles, the consistency of their testimony. But that's not the only people that Jesus prays for here. Go down to verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the apostles, but for those also who believe in me through their word. What did we talk about last week? We talked about the apostles' teaching. What did the 3,000 believe in Acts chapter 2? Peter's word. Peter's logos. Peter's preaching. And these 3,000 believed based on the word of Peter. Now, by the, we know it was by the calling of the Holy Spirit. We know it was a work of regeneration in their hearts. We do know all of that. But it was through Peter's word, wasn't it? That's how God brought these people to himself. And now, how do, I, how do I believe? I believe also through the teaching of the apostles. It is their teaching handed down to me in the New Testament that has taught me to believe in who Christ is, to have salvation. Jesus is praying for us. He is praying, and I believe this wholeheartedly, because he is God, that in his mind at this moment when he's on earth praying this, I believe in his mind he's thinking, Norton Baptist Church. Not because we're the only church, that's not what I mean. I think he's thinking of every church. And I think he knows every church's name. And I think he's praying here, and he's, the people of Norton Baptist Church, Father, make them one. Make them one as, as we are one. So let's look at what he says there. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, 
so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. Do you see that emphasis? Just like this. Exactly like this. A oneness that is so different because God is holy. His unity is holy. It's not like any oneness you see on earth. You know, I think of a, our country, you know, one nation. Really? I don't think we are. I think we're multiple nations in some ways, right? There's no oneness in our nation. I'm not bemoaning that. It's not supposed to be that way. Because the oneness is in the church. It's not out there. The true fellowship is in the church. Verse 23, I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Let me tell you something. The greatest evangelical tool that the church has today is our unity. It's our togetherness. It's our oneness. I know we all want to put together different programs to reach the lost, and I, I'm not opposed to some of those programs. Don't get me wrong, but what I am saying is, if we don't get this right, you can forget about it. You can forget about it. If we don't get this right, this is what Jesus ordained, that people would believe in him, that they would know him. Both verses 20, I think it's 21 and 23 say this. They would know him through us and our unity together and our oneness together. And I do not believe that he's talking specifically or only about the invisible church. I believe this expression here on earth is supposed to be done in the visible church. It's supposed to be done in Norton Baptist Church and every other church that claims the name of Christ. There should be a perfect unity among us. A perfect unity. That's what we are called to. Do you see why I said earlier there's no concept in Scripture of a Christian who's not part of a church? You can't be one with people you won't associate with. You can't be a fellowship with people you won't have unity with. That is completely impossible. The world, you say, how does this work out? How do they, how does the world come to Christ by the people loving one another? I can think of two people who are in this room who have shared with me that whether it was driving by or whether it was through just a chance event they ended up in this fellowship and they saw what God was doing here and God brought them to himself. One of them wasn't, one of them is here since I've been here, one of them was here when I got here. But they both shared with me that. You don't get together for your Bible study, I don't think, and think, my car in the parking lot is going to be a witness to people. But it is. It has been. God has done that. Do not underestimate how God is working. When, when God says he does something, he does it. So my first response to the question of how does this work is, you don't need to know. Just obey, right? But I understand it's okay to ask the wise. It's okay to ask the how. So I'm not picking on you for asking. I asked this week while I was studying, how does this work, God? And I don't know all the nuances, but I know this. We're supposed to have such a unity, such a oneness among us. That almost kind of rhymes. Such a oneness among us. Kind of like that. Just kind of struck me. We're supposed to have such a great unity here that the world says there's nothing else on earth like it. Like there's nothing else like this. That's unity. That's fellowship. Remember last week when I said... We need to change. I don't think we've arrived. I think we're still a ways off. I'm not picking on anybody in particular. I just think we've got far to go, and I think as we continue to look at Acts chapter 2, we're going to find that out. So let's do that. Acts chapter 2, back there again. Let's look at the remaining of verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread 
And I believe the rest of this text is describing the fellowship that they had. And here we have the breaking of bread. Now, excuse me. Now, when Luke writes, he may use that term breaking of bread to refer to meals together, which it can. He also may use that term for the Lord's Supper. And I think in our text we have both uses, uses. And I think here it is the Lord's Supper. It's communion together. They were devoted to having communion together. A local church must have communion. I don't think that we have to change that here. We have communion every month on the last Sunday of the month. The only thing I may ask is, are you devoted to it? Do you try to make sure to not miss any Sundays devoted to fellowship, but do you also try to make sure I really don't want to miss communion? Do you think about, ah, oh, it's communion Sunday coming up. Looking forward to that. Or is it just an addition to the beginning or middle of the service or the end of the service? We try to do it at the beginning or the middle. But what is it? Does it is it meaningful to us? Um, and I'm, I'm talking to myself as much as you. Is our communion together, when we practice the Lord's Supper, is it becoming more meaningful to us the more we practice it? It ought to. And I would, I would just encourage you to, to soften your heart and be devoted to make sure that, that last Sunday of the month that I'm going to do my best to make sure my schedule doesn't conflict with that one. I would say do your best to make sure your schedule never conflicts with a Sunday, but, but that one especially I would be devoted to the fellowship, and I want to be a part of the Lord's Supper. You know, some churches do it more often. Some churches do it less often. Scripture didn't say how often. I think once a month is great. I love that. That's what I grew up with, and I like it, because it's not so frequent that it, it just could fall into the mundane, but it's not so rare that it feels like we never do this, you know? So I think there's a good balance, but I wouldn't pick on a church that does it every Sunday. I wouldn't pick on a church that does it once a year. Maybe a little bit I'd pick on them, but not so much. <laughs> but I think, I think we have a good balance here. And so I'm not looking to change that, but I'm, what I'm asking is, is do you need to examine yourself? Is this a meaningful time? Do I take that as a meaningful event, that ordinance, that command to practice the Lord's Supper. And then he also says, and to the prayers. On most Sundays, we run about 140. On prayer meeting on Wednesday night, we probably average closer to 40. I'm doing that math. It's not hard. And I'm a math guy. That's about 100 people. And there probably is close to 100 people this morning that never darkened the door of a prayer meeting. I don't, go, I don't understand that. If we're going to be devoted to the fellowship, there's two aspects to this. Devoted to the fellowship, which means devoted to when we get together, devoted to the unity that we have. And the other aspect is devoted to prayers. The early church was. Paul said, pray without ceasing. By the way, that was written to the church in Thessalonica, not to the individuals of the church of Thessalonica, but to the church. Pray without ceasing. And it's not so much that our attendance is low because the fellowship is sweet, by the way. So you're missing out. I mean, we just have a great time together. So it's sweet. I'm not complaining about low attendance. That doesn't matter to me. I'm not complaining about anything, but what I want to challenge us is if, if we as a church are going to be what God desires for us to be, we ought to be more devoted to prayer and coming together. And I'm not going to say... Every time the church doors are open, everybody ought to be here. I won't go that far, although I would question why you wouldn't want to be most of that time. But I would say this, that you could devote every other Wednesday or once a month on a Wednesday to praying together. Couldn't you? How many things in your life are you spending your time on other than prayer meeting? What are you doing on Wednesday night? Now, all of you are getting uncomfortable here. Well, except for 40 of you. <laughs> <laughs> or so. There's more than that that come on an on a, on a off and on basis. But my, my point is this, is, is we're being hindered in the fellowship. We're being hindered in the church by people just not making that a priority in their lives. And I, I think 
pulling out about, because by the time you get ready and come and go home, unless you're sitting with the Alexanders like I do till 10 o'clock, um, <laughs> hey, it's your fault, Tim. I'm going to blame you. Um, but you're talking about two hours. What do you waste two hours on in a week? Football game? I mean, football games are longer than two hours. Like, if we're going to be devoted to one another, I think prayer meetings should be a place we're devoted. And I'm not, I'm not insisting that we have everybody here every time. But goodness, could you come once in a while? Could, could you just say, I, I want to be a prayer warrior for Norton Baptist Church. I want to plead with God on behalf of the people, on behalf of the church, on behalf of the fellowship. The early church was, and I believe it's an example for us. I mean, you can look throughout the scriptures and find all kinds of places where we're commanded to pray. So there is no escaping that. And so maybe you can't make every Wednesday. I understand that. But let's make more. Let's change. Did you think the change I talked about last week was going to be somebody else? It's going to be us. It's going to be the we. And that's the change that I would call you to as your shepherd who's trying to care for your soul and trying to care for the souls of everyone. And I really believe it will impact the body of Christ. I believe it will impact Norton Baptist Church. I believe we ought to believe God when he says he works through that. That's all I'm doing is just believing God. It's all I got. Got nothing else. Going on in verse 43, 43, yes. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. When was the last time you did a miracle here in our midst? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Notice, who received the Holy Spirit? The apostles had already received the Spirit. It was evidenced by their speaking in tongues, right? Languages they did not know. 3,000 now have received the Spirit. Notice what didn't happen. They didn't all speak in tongues. They didn't all start doing signs and wonders. They received the Spirit. So if somebody ever says to you, have you received the Spirit? And you're in Christ, you can say, absolutely I have. Well, have you spoken in tongues? Go to this text and say, these people didn't do any signs and wonders. None. They were done through the apostles. The apostles did them. And so let the apostles do them. I'm no apostle. I got no signs, no wonders, no miracles for you. I can pray for healing. James chapter 5 says that. I had an opportunity to do that this morning. That's not a sign and wonder. If God chooses to heal, that's a sign and wonder from him. I didn't work anything. Let him him do the work. But so we don't see signs and wonders in that first church, do we? Except for done by the apostles. And why was it done by the apostles? Because they were the messengers bringing forth the word because there was no written word of God. But now we have their testimony. We have the testimony of others who have witnessed those signs and wonders. It's here. Peter says we have the more sure word. It's better. Because I think sometimes we're like, I'd love to see a sign or wonder. Read the Bible. There's a lot, a lot, lot in there that will be wonder to you, right? That's where we see what God has given to us. It's better, that more sure word. In verses 44 and 45, it says, And all those who, were, who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were dividing them up with all as anyone might have need. They had all things in common sell my land and give the proceeds and help somebody who has a need. We need to be a generous church to one another, don't we? We need to be generous. If there's need among us, we want to provide it. And I feel confident that I can say to people when there is need, talk to me about it. I think our church would step up. I think they will. I think we as a body would care for someone who has need. I believe that. You know, maybe you say, well, I can't write big checks. Yeah, but if a hundred of us wrote a small check, we could get a lot of money together, couldn't we? To help somebody do something that they had need of. Now notice, it was not to make the apostles prosperous. So that the apostles could live their best life now and get their Lamborghini. That's not what's going on here. It was giving to help the one another. And it was given to, really, you could say, the church or the fellowship, right? It was given to them. And other places in Scripture, we see they took a collection for the church or the fellowship in Jerusalem. We see that 
in other places in the epistles. And something that struck me this week, and this is, I want you to know, this is not a hill I will die on, okay? Um, but it's just got me thinking, because I am thinking through the sufficiency of Scripture for the church, and I thought about giving. And I thought, where in the world did we come up with the idea, or where in Scripture might be a better question, right? Did we come up with the idea of designations? That I get to control my money when I give it to the church? Where did we come up with that? Like, as I, as I think through it, I'm like, I don't know why we do that. Now, before you think I'm picking on somebody, I just gave on Friday and I designated money for three different areas of our church. So I'm, not pick, I'm just asking the question. Is there some sense in which we are trying to, trying to remain independent in our giving by saying, I want my money to go to, let's, let's use examples that are current today. I want my money to go to the kitchen. I want my money to go to missions. But I want my money to go here, and I want my money to go to the Barnabas Barrel. Is there a sense in which we're trying to maintain our individuality and trying to maintain our control over the finances of the church? Wouldn't it make more sense as a fellowship to put it all together? And let me say this. I love what we do with the 21% that gets kicked over to missions. Why? Because we as a fellowship chose to do that. The fellowship said, if you can't give us a dollar, you're going to give us 79 cents, 21 cents is going to missions. I love that. Why? Because the fellowship chose that. The fellowship did that. But I think sometimes when we, and I'm just asking you to think about it. When we, when we step back and we examine, well, I want my money to go here. I want my money to go here. We're giving with strings attached. And let me tell you, when we give with strings attached, that's not generosity. And so just think about it. And and I know maybe you don't even think that way about it because I didn't until this week. I started to sort through. I just get your wheels spinning a little bit. That's, again, not a hill I would die on. Just something to think through. Are we promoting unity in our giving? Are we promoting unity in our giving, the unity of the fellowship? And maybe you could say, in a sense, we are still because the church approves of the kitchen. The church approves of mission. So we're not being disunified but I just, I just think it's good for us to think through those things. I think we should question all kinds of things we do. You'll find that coming forward in future sermons, I'm sure. Verse 46, And daily devoting themselves with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Daily devoting themselves. You know, I, I think some people shuddered when I asked them to consider coming to Wednesday night. Notice I didn't ask you for Monday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday too, but these people were daily devoted to one another. Daily. That's a lot. <laughs> they were devoted to one another. I, I think some people have trouble just weekly devoting. Won't be in church, Pastor. I got this going on or that going on. Just weekly. <laughs> these people were daily Daily devoted. And I believe there's such great value in having meals together and having people in your home or maybe going out with them if you feel like your home's not suitable. Your home is suitable, by the way. If you can eat there, anybody can. Um, you may have to clean, but, but your home is suitable. I, we used to use that as an excuse. And, um, and I remember being, I don't know, this is probably about... 15 years ago. And we were kind of lamenting on a Friday night. We never get invited to do anything with anybody. We just, we're lonely and kind of woe is me kind of attitude. And probably some of you have had that in your own life. And of course, it hit me eventually. The Holy Spirit kind of thumped me and said, uh, so who'd you invite over Friday night? You know, oh, nobody. Well, maybe that's why you're lonely because <laughs> you don't invite anybody over. And so we did invite some people. Some people seemed to never be able to make it, but others were able to make it. We started to have some sweet fellowship with some people in the church. There's something special about sitting around a table with each other and just having some good conversation with other believers. There's a oneness that comes out of that. And I would encourage you to do more of that, to do more of that together. 
And I'm not talking about inviting me over. I'm fat enough. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. You can, but I'm just saying, I'm talking about the one another. To, to just do more of that fellowship together. Don't, you don't have to wait. Some people will say, when are we doing our next fellowship dinner? I'm like, you can do one Friday if you want to. Just invite a few people over. And that's sweet, isn't it? Those of you who have experienced it are like, yeah, it is. It's so sweet. So don't, don't hesitate to get to know one another. I would say this. Hang out after the service. Don't book out those doors as soon as the... As soon as I finish that last passage and, and I say, thank you for being here, you are dismissed, and boom! It's like some, some people are just, you know, there's smoke behind them as they're burning rubber out of the head. Don't be that way. Be devoted to the fellowship. Be devoted to one another. Sit around and talk. It's enjoyable. And that's how we get to love one another. You know, I... I'll go to the mat for somebody that I know really well and care about deeply. Somebody that's a little more distant, I won't quite go to the mat, mat, to, mat so easily, right? I won't go the distance for somebody that's not as close to me. But we've got to get close with one another. That's something we need to change. I think we're doing better than I've ever seen lately. Um, I can see that. But I think we need to improve And I would challenge you, what do you need to do differently to be devoted to the one another here? What what in your own life would you say, that's something I could work on, that's something I could do to be devoted? And I think it's so good here in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. It seems as though they would get together and part of their time might have been singing some psalms together. Let's sing to the Lord together. And, and some people do that. They'll, they'll have a little hymn sing together with some people and some friends. We, we aren't good at that in our family, but we did do it, a, I don't know, a year or two ago on a, on a holiday. We, we sang together a, a song together. And I thought, you know, that was sweet. No, I didn't implement it again. Shame on me. But it's something I think can be very sweet in a home and very sweet with other believers is to just praise God together. And it seems as though as they did that, that it, it was evident to the world around them because they were finding favor with all the people. As the church was unified, the world was recognizing it. The world was seeing it because they were finding favor with all these people. The world was seeing it going, that's beautiful. That's sweet what those people are doing. You know, I heard my neighbor had a need and these people came together and supplied for that need. Who does that? Who gives like that? And we see that last section there in verse 47, and the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Now this, friends, is a church growth model. Daily, people were being added to the body of Christ. Daily. They were meeting daily, and people were added daily. I believe if we were to devote ourselves to these things as a church, that we might be scared at the growth that God could bring to Norton Baptist Church. And I would pray not transfer growth from other churches, but people who just... I want this in my life. What is with you people? Whatever it is, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of this fellowship. Well, our fellowship is with Jesus Christ and with the Spirit. Who's that? Let's talk about it. And we get chances to share the gospel with people. It's what happened to the early church, and I believe God is still working the same way today. God can do things however he wishes to do them. I understand that. I've seen God work miracles in my own life and the lives of others in ways that I didn't find in scripture. I've seen him do it. He can work however he pleases. He does whatever he wants. But God also has ordained means by how he says he will accomplish things. And the ordained means, if you want to call it church growth, is through being devoted to one another. 
being devoted to the fellowship. That's his ordained means. If we don't want to be a dying church, we've got to be devoted to the fellowship. We can't, and, and I want to say this, we can't just be individuals who come together. That's the whole idea of fellowship. We can't just be a bunch of individuals with our individual opinions, with our individual desires, and our individual will who come together and say, well, we'll put aside those things for now so we can have a peaceful time together. No, we have got to be devoted to one another, setting aside my individuality. And this is so countercultural in America today. I think, I brought up designations. Why did I bring that up? Because I think we are so culturally immersed in the American church that we have no idea how it's impacting us. That we just have no idea all the things we do that we adopted in from the world out there rather than just going to scripture and says, what does it say? It happens over years, it happens over time, and then, then that person did this and we grew up doing that, so we just repeat the process. At some point, we've got to stop and examine it all through the sufficient word of God, don't we? And that's really the purpose of this series. One thing that was not mentioned in the devoted to the fellowship that I do want to address as we close. Over the last three years, I think four times, I've had people come to me, and I would say it this way, they, they, they drop a truth bomb. Let me tell you what I think about you. <laughs> or let me tell you what I think about this church. And they dropped their truth bomb. It was negative, all of this. And they said, and we're leaving. Or I'm leaving. I think it's happened four times. There was no opportunity. I mean, it's the first I've heard of it with these people that they're having an issue. No opportunity to solve it to talk through it. It was just, we gone. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that in the last days, men will become irreconcilable. Among a list of other things, blasphemers and all kinds of other wickedness, one of the terms is used, irreconcilable. Let me tell you, if you come into some fellowship, a church, and you become a member there, and then one day you decide you're not happy, you've been hurt, maybe legitimately hurt, somebody made you angry, maybe that happened, and you walk into the pastor's office and you drop your truth bomb and say, I'm out of here, you are irreconcilable. You're not seeking to solve it, you're seeking to drop whatever you think makes you feel better, which it might make you feel better, I'll tell you, in the moment, I've done those types of things in my own life, it makes you feel better for a moment, sin is always pleasurable for a season, but when you leave, it's not going to help you at all. I'm going to make a promise to you. If you stay here long enough, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> That's a very nice promise. <laughs> it's just reality. Remember what I said. We are people who are changing. Right? So that means... We still need change. That we aren't completely changed. None of us are. And so if you stay at Norton Baptist Church long enough, something's going to offend you, something's going to hurt you, something's going to make you angry. It's just, it's a given. Why? Because we're failable people. We don't do it intentionally. I hope if we do, there's such a thing called church discipline, and we'll put somebody through that process, but we don't do it intentionally, but it's going to happen. A misunderstanding, something's going to happen. But let me make another commitment to you. That if you come to me and express that, desiring reconciliation, I will commit to pursuing reconciliation with you. And if it's with another person, pursuing reconciliation with them. And I will call them, if you say, well, they'll never reconcile with me. They may not. I can't force them to, but I will call them to it. Because it's sin not to reconcile. And so when we talk about the early church being devoted to the fellowship, I think that's a big part of it. They were devoted. They were committed. Devoted in the sense 
that, yes, I was hurt. Do you know how many times I've been hurt in four and a half years here? I don't want to count. I don't even know. And I don't really care. You know why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. And I love you. You are too important to me and to one another to just disregard somebody because of hurt. You say, but it was real hurt. Oh, I'm not denying real hurt. I've had it. What I'm saying is the Bible calls us to peace. Not peace faking, peacemaking, which I warn people. Usually at marriage counseling, I'll do this. Two people come in, and they're at each other's throats, and I say, well, I think, I think that we can solve this if you're both willing to submit to Christ, but I want to say one thing. It might get worse before it gets better. And it usually does. <laughs> usually I start calling them to something and they, ah! and then it gets worse. But then somehow God in his miraculous ways, through the word of God as they're being taught, does his work in a heart and suddenly peace comes out of that. I would say this, if you're not reconciled with somebody here, let's fix it now. Let's not wait till the next blow up. Let's not, let's not just be walking by each other. I don't know if that exists, but we're gonna, we need to deal with it all the time. We need to keep short accounts with one another and say, my hurt is not more important than the fellowship that I'm devoted to. I need to bear up with all of you, and you need to bear up with me. And I know I can be a bear to bear up with sometimes, but that's okay. I'm going to keep changing too. I love you all. Honestly, I do. I'm so grateful for Norton Baptist Church. And so we're going to work at these things, being devoted to one another, being devoted to fellowship, all for the glory of God. Father, thank you for the fellowship. Who could have imagined the design of the church but you? There is no God like you. A gracious God, a merciful God who takes irreconcilable sinners and reconciles them to you through your Son by the power of the Holy Spirit and then reconciles them to one another through the fellowship of the Spirit and the Son and the Father. Thank you for making us a part of it. Father, help us to live it out. I don't even know the next steps sometimes to take, but I pray that you would go ahead of us Lead us and guide us in each heart. Knit our hearts together as one. I pray along with my Lord, make us one as you and Jesus are one, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.